Um, thank you for attending the 22nd Annual New Mexico Data Users Conference. Um, we're excited that we could provide this format for you this year. You know, I, it was one of those things where we know with COVID that we couldn't have done this in person. And I'm glad that you have all been able to um, register and log in. If you registered for just a couple of items, but then you look at the conference um, outline and you say, gosh, there's some other things, please feel free to jump in and attend any of the sessions, even if you only registered for one or two. Um, we've got three sessions today and three sessions on Friday. And then we have two sessions, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So for a total of 12 sessions, a lot of good speakers covering a lot of interesting topics. Um, and if you've been following the 2020 census, certainly the enumeration has completed, but there is all the processing that the Census Bureau does. And then the they have to um, up apply differential privacy this time around to protect people's confidential data. And um, we're all interested to see how that's going to impact our numbers um, coming out in 2021. Uh, there is not actually, and it, as of this morning, we had a, co a conversation or some communication from the Census Bureau not telling us that they're not sure when the actual deadlines are for the data that they're processing to be ready for us. We may see files um, December 31st, um, but we may not actually see files until early January. So keep keep your ears and eyes uh, tuned for when our data products will start coming out for us from the 2020 census. This morning, we are going to have, this is the first session of the conference, and it's going to be on our econo the Bieber economic forecast. Unfortunately, due to unforese unforeseen ex um, events, Jeffrey Mitchell will be unable to present this morning, but we will actually have Michael O'Donnell. Michael O'Donnell has been a researcher with us since 2010, so he's been uh, working on the economic forecast for over 20, 10 years at this point, point. Um, and he's going to present in Jeff's uh, stead. He also does, he's got his PhD in economics, he also has a JD. He is responsible for doing our quarterly economic forecast prog program, but he also regularly eng engages in other research projects related to tax, regulatory, demographic analysis, policy, housing policy, revenue forecasts, um, and he's been a joy to work with over the years. So without further ado, let's go ahead and see if Michael O'Donnell here can log in and share his screen. There we go. All right, look at that. I'm assuming you can all see that. Okay, great. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, as Susan mentioned, obviously Jeff won't be here today. I apologize, he's much more erudite than myself, but I will do my best nonetheless, and we will push through. So without further ado, let me go ahead and get started. Um, Normally, I know when Jeff does this, and I know he's done this for uh, many years now, uh, I know that he often will kind of just talk about the New Mexico economy. I think given what's going on nationally and internationally, it's probably appropriate to just go ahead and briefly talk about the US economy for just a minute, because I think that that helps. I mean, the New Mexico economy obviously is a part of the US economy. I think it helps to give a little bit of context given the pandemic and given the economic recession and all of that. So let me go ahead and get started. And there's a few points that I just wanna make in this. And this is gonna be a pretty, pretty short segment here. So a real quick review of the national economy. Um, so through October, the US economy has added back about 12 million jobs of the 22.2 million jobs that were lost in March and April. So of course, those of us who watch the data that come out every month, we saw huge job losses in March and April. And I'll have a couple slides that show kind of the extent of those losses in a minute. Um, though the rate of job addition has slowed. So while we were seeing, you know, a million and a half to a million jobs added kind of right after those losses, as sort of would be expected as the bounce back started to happen, the rate has started to slow. And so now we're seeing job addition in the range of kind of 600 to 700,000 over the previous month. In 2020, because we had a couple, uh, we had a few months of job addition before we lost those jobs in March and April, 
for the entire year so far, the US economy is down 9.6 million jobs. In addition to that, uh, initial claims for unemployment insurance and continuing claims for unemployment continue to remain high. I'll, have, I'll show you a slide on this in a second. And we'll kind of reference back to those slide, the US slide, at least kind of anecdotally, I suppose, when I get to a New Mexico slide that's gonna show some similar information. Uh, GDP, so another piece of headline data that we always look at when we're producing our economy for the, uh, our forecast for the US, or excuse me, the forecast for the New Mexico economy is US GDP or gross domestic product. So through the year so far, the first three quarters, minus 5.1%, excuse me, 5% in the first quarter, minus 31% in the second quarter, and plus 33% in the third quarter. I'm not going to spend too much time here because I'm going to have a slide, actually my next slide, where I'm going to talk a little bit more about what those numbers mean, just to give you an idea when you see these kind of, uh, when I use this term of our ginormous numbers of minus 31% plus 33%, kind of what that actually means. West Texas Intermediate spot price of crude oil, and I'm going to have a couple slides for the New Mexico section that talk about West Texas Intermediate and oil in kind of general. Um, obviously, for those who pay attention to the New Mexico economy, pay attention to the New Mexico state budget, oil prices are extremely important. It's an input in a sense into the actual kind of state budget and monies that the state has available at its disposal to spend. So this is a kind of headline number that we watch very closely. Consumer sentiment as uh, judged by the consumer sentiment index from the University of Michigan is low and it's been low for some time. Uh, obviously, since the beginning of the pandemic, consumer confidence or consumer sentiment, I should say, took a hit and it's continued to stay low. The next month's data, which isn't actually out yet in terms of the total aggregate numbers, uh, should actually tick down a tad uh, from what I've seen from the preliminary data. The stock market, as uh, given by the Dow Jones Industrial Index, of course, this is something that we watch as well. Uh, when I wrote this slide, it was right about 29,000 points. And this morning uh, I looked and it's actually closer to 30,000. So the stock market for, for those of you who pay attention to these data is up quite high. Uh, the information that I've kind of read this morning that has to do with uh, another manufacturer of, of a vaccine for COVID uh, producing results recently, yesterday, I think, indicating that their new vaccine is 95% effective. So the stock market obviously bounced. Um, when the initial, um, uh, and I can't remember which manufacturers they were, when the initial announcement came from the other manufacturer last week that they had a 90% success rate, the stock market bounced there too. So it's probably not surprising. Various indices that we watch suggest actually that the economy is expanding after its very low lows that we were seeing in the midst of the pandemic. Um, kind of my last bullet point that I wanna just touch on real quick. There's some concern that the US economy is already losing steam, obviously, uh, I already mentioned the, the jobs numbers, the rate at which jobs are being added over the month is starting to kind of slow. And we'll see that in a slide in a minute. And uh, that kind of portends a little bit of um, concern going forward. In addition to that, COVID hotspots are continuing. Uh, and, you know, again, obviously we're all here because we all look at data. We all like watching data and see it coming in. This is another piece of data that we've obviously been looking at very closely. And when we're seeing kind of um, nationally and statewide, we're seeing records being broken very regularly, nearly on a daily basis for several days last week. Uh, and the implications that that might have in terms of us reopening the economy, that is obviously a cause for concern. In addition to that, of course, nationally, about a thousand deaths or more per day on average the last couple of weeks. Uh, and, and in addition to that, kind of on a national level, uh, is there going to be another round of fiscal stimulus? I can tell you kind of in the summer months, we had expected that Congress and the president would put forward an additional round of st kind of stimulus similar to what we had seen kind of early uh, summer, late spring, early summer. Obviously that looks like that's not happening this year, but perhaps it could happen coming into next year. And then finally, my last point is that the, the forecast that Jeff and I developed um, and that we worked on here for the New Mexico economy, and actually for, for the national forecast that we use in it as an input to creating our New Mexico forecast was developed prior to the election. So the degree to which we expect um, our forecast to change, if at all, is 
kind of yet to be seen. Clearly, we don't know exactly what the, uh, the, 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 the policy agendas are going to be, what things can really get through in terms of a new administration, or whether sort of divided government will um, sort of keep the status quo for at least the foreseeable future. So just a few points on the, the national economy. And uh, obviously all of these things kind of feed into the New Mexico or, or, or our understanding of the New Mexico economy. Okay, so this is a chart that I almost always show when I give a forecast and it's uh, US GDP growth. And really the only thing I'm gonna pay attention to for the purposes of this presentation is the top line number, the gross domestic product, kind of the, the very top number up there. So as I mentioned at the, at the start, GDP contracted about 5%. And these numbers, just so you kind of understand how they work, they're what's called seasonally adjusted at an annual rate. That is to say, these numbers are annualized. That they take into account essentially um, compounding. So, as as it turns out, the economy didn't actually contract by five percent in the first quarter. The economy contracted by, if you actually look at the data, something on the order of one, 1.2% 1 or so in the first quarter of the year. If the economy continued to contract at that same rate for the remainder of the year, the US uh, economy would have contracted by 5% for the year compared to 2019. So that's how those numbers work. So we go on to the next quarter, the economy, it says, contracted by 31.4%. If you actually look at the data, the economy contracted really by about seven, excuse me, about 9%. And so if the economy contracted by that same rate throughout the entire year, calendar year, the economy would have contracted 31.4%. So when you see these kind of eye popping numbers, just keep in mind that we're not literally saying that the economy shrank by 31% or that it grew by 31%. So when you kind of make those numbers more in line to what the quarter over quarter growth rates are, it would be something like in the first quarter of the economy shrank by about 1%, in the second quarter about 9%, and then in the third quarter it grew by about 7 point something percent. One thing, or actually a couple things to point out about that that I think are important. Um, if we were going to say we wanted to make the economy in 2020 be uh, excuse me, the, the economy in 2020 quarter four to be at the same level as the economy in 2019 quarter four, that is to say 0% year over year growth. What we would end up with for the year if we took the average is still a contraction of the economy on average for 2020 compared to 2019. I'm only really bringing this up because it would have been the first contraction that, that we have seen for an entire year since 2009, which grew about negative 2.5%. If the economy ends up at a similar size in 2020 quarter four as 2019 quarter four, that rate will be about minus 3%. So sort of in, the, in a similar ballpark, even though we would have regained back the level that we were in 2019. So just to kind of give you some idea there. In addition to that, if you look at 2020 quarter two, which contracted 31.4%, and then 2020 quarter three, which grew at 33.1%, we're actually not getting back all of what we had lost the quarter prior, because what you're doing is even though the rate of growth is more rapid, you're coming from a lower base, which gives you a still a smaller number. It would have had to grow a little bit faster than 33.1% to gain back everything that was lost the quarter prior. Um, so I, again, I don't want to belabor this too any more than I don't want to belabor it more than I already have, but just to give you an idea of what the overall U.S. economy looks like and how that plays into our New Mexico forecast. Employment is obviously something that we look at very closely. So uh, as we all have kind of paid attention to, I'm sure, we saw that there were huge losses. And as I mentioned at the outset, uh, 1.4 million jobs lost in March and 20, about 21 million jobs lost in, in April. As I mentioned, about 12 million jobs have added since then. For the year, we're down about 9.6 million jobs. In terms of the unemployment rate, it spiked. It was at 3.5% in February, spiked up to 14.7% in March, and it's come down to 6.9%, which actually is a little bit artificially low because the participation rate is still low and because the way that they're counting some folks in or out of the labor force um, is undercounting some of the folks that would be otherwise unemployed. And that's given by what the Bureau of Labor Statistics has said in terms of 
the way that they're counting folks. Okay, so over the month job gains, and again, this is nationally, um, showing this slide, basically to show you this kind of the almost comical uh, graph that ends up uh, uh, that ends up being developed as a result of losing those nearly 21 million jobs in April. It dwarfs everything that came before it going back to 2010 in terms of those levels. So where we're adding on average something like about 180,000 jobs per month over the period from I think October 2010 until sort of the beginning of the pandemic. That huge reduction in jobs in April makes all of those gains prior to that look minuscule. Obviously, there was a relatively large bounce back since then, which we see those bars above the 0% line, uh, or, or, excuse me, up the, above the 0 millions line. Uh, but nonetheless, the rate at which those jobs are being added has started to slow. Okay, so with that in kind of context, let me move on to the New Mexico review and the New Mexico economy. Um, obviously, I know that that's why people are here and this is what they're sort of more interested in hearing about. Uh, but again, I think that understanding what's going on with the US economy helps lay kind of some important foundation. So the New Mexico current economic situation, obviously, almost everything here that I'm going to talk about is going to be dictated by COVID. Um, whether businesses are open or being able to stay open, whether businesses are allowed to uh, have, you know, if it's an accommodation uh, type of business in terms of a food establishment, or a hotel or a retail establishment or any number of places. Uh, the kind of the, 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 the posture that we have vis-a-vis uh, -vis COVID is sort of gonna dictate the way that the economy is likely to proceed. Obviously with the spikes that we've had more recently, we can imagine that the rate of economic growth is going to sort of take a hit. And I think that's what the expectation is nationally Clearly in New Mexico, COVID is going to cause some uh, problems or concerns anyway, moving forward. Un unemployment insurance claims, uh, both continuing and um, initial claims are high. Obviously I showed the slide for the US, they're high there. In New Mexico, they're slightly more elevated and I'll have a couple slides that show you this in a moment. Uh, at the end of October, um, continuing claims were sitting around 70,000. So 70,000 people that have claim, unemployment insurance claims, that's down from a high of about 105,000 in May, but still very elevated. And you'll be able to see the scale of how elevated those are, those numbers are relative to historical numbers in a moment. Sort of as I alluded to, leisure and hospitality industries and retail trade industries are hit hardest by the pandemic, as you can imagine, with the closures of uh, or um, limitations uh, of retail hours and um, uh, the, the guidelines that have been put forth uh, by the state. Uh, obviously, those industries are expected. Clearly, uh, those are the ones that have taken sort of the biggest hit. Although other industries, uh, few of them have really been spared throughout this pandemic. But those are the ones that, if you just look at the raw numbers and the number of people kind of getting unemployment insurance or not being able to work or working uh, significantly reduced hours, those industries tend to be the hardest hit. So the next bullet, despite the, uh, and this is kind of nationally, of course, the executive order for enhanced unemployment insurance. So um, if you recall back sort of around April or so, there was, in addition to extending the length of uh, uh, unemployment insurance that folks were eligible for, there was this additional enhanced unemployment insurance coverage where if you were unemployed, you would get an additional kind of sum of money. It was $600 per week. Um, there was some discussion a couple months back that, that in, there would be another enhanced UI coverage that would be extended and that you know, hopefully it would be around $600 as well. That didn't seem to go through uh, Congress particularly well. By executive order, President Trump actually extended it, I think through December or through at least half of December, but at $300. So I'll have a slide that shows you how New Mexico has sort of, and a slide that uh, has a graph actually that we sort of poached from the New York Times 
that shows how beneficial those $600 checks were to New Mexico. And the fact of the matter is uh, that failure to enact additional stimulus will hit New Mexico sort of disproportionately hard, or even cutting the stimulus in half from 600 to 300 hits New Mexico particularly hard. So as I mentioned as well, uh, West Texas Intermediate, that's kind of the price that we look at. There's various prices of, of oil, uh, but West Texas Intermediate tends to be the one that we look at most closely. Uh, I checked it this morning, it was about 41.50 a barrel. It had dipped down to below $40 a barrel for some time, uh, sitting around $40 a barrel now, slightly above that the last couple of days, probably because the market, and by market, I mean the stock market is doing relatively well, again, as the hope of there being potentially a vaccine on the horizon um, has uh, kind of come, come about. Uh, so this plays an important role, as I mentioned, in terms of determining how much revenue the state receives from kind of royalty payments from this industry. So from the state's perspective, it would prefer relatively high oil prices because that directly goes into the revenue calculation for the budget. So although oil production remains high, any softening in production or price will impact state budget. And so because we have these kind of dual forces of COVID sort of shutting down or limiting operations with tons of industries, as well as the oil industry having to battle these relatively low oil prices, the state budget is kind of being pinched from two very important angles. And so you can imagine that in terms of gross receipts, the state sort of, especially in the summer months, uh, was uh, kind of dealing with a revenue shortfall. And so I'll show you a slide that, that um, kind of points that out as well. And again, so all of these points that I'm making here, I'm going to have a few slides that just kind of go through these, these major themes. Okay, so back to unemployment insurance claims by state. So this, this graph, it's a little bit hard to um, kind of understand, I think, just on its own. But uh, I'll go through the numbers real quick, and then I'll give you the kind of the takeaway. So as of kind of mid-October, about 73,000 New Mexicans were on New Mexicans were on unemployment insurance. That compares to a historical average of, of about 8,500. So we are well, well above what we were seeing kind of historically. At its peak in May, about 13.1% of unemployment insurance eligible New Mexicans were on unemployment insurance. That's somewhere in the middle of the pack in terms of percentages. So kind of doing average relative to the other states. Since that week, uh, unemployment insurance rolls have declined by about 32.7% of peak enrollment. That is the lowest rate of return amongst the states. I'll explain what this means kind of in a more, uh, uh, in a little bit more kind of straightforward way in a second, because I, even for me, just reading it, it's a little bit confusing. Uh, thus, as of, as of mid-October, 8.8% of New Mexico workforce remains on unemployment insurance. So the only states that are worse in terms of numbers, that, that is to say that have higher rates are California and Hawaii. So what does this mean? What this means is that in terms of the percentage of the workforce that ended up on unemployment insurance, we were kind of average. Uh, we were sort of in the middle of the pack. But even though we were sort of in the middle of the pack in terms of the number of folks that ended up with the percentage of the workforce that ended up on unemployment, we, the folks who um, ended up going back to work, was rel there were relatively fewer folks or relatively smaller percentage of those folks going back to work compared to the other states. So although we were sort of middle of the pack in terms of being unemployed, we're not very good at getting people back to work relative to the other states. What that translates into, even though we weren't so bad in terms of the unemployment part of it, is that we have this relatively high percentage of people that are still employed. So, um, you know, as you can imagine, this is something that we look at closely and, you know, we're looking at who it is that's coming on the rolls, who's coming off the rolls, and we just still have a lot of people on the rolls relative to other states, at least through mid-October. So another way to kind of look at these unemployment insurance numbers is looking at this slide. So on the bars, kind of reference to the right axis, uh, 
we've got initial claims for unemployment insurance. On the left axis, we've got continuing claims for unemployment insurance, that's the line. Obviously, you can see that the scales are different on both axes, so clearly that's, that's important. You're gonna have more people on continuing unemployment insurance than you have kind of weekly being added to the roles. And so these data here are from New Mexico uh, Department of Workforce Solutions. The data that I kind of pointed out before are from BLS itself. Obviously, they work very closely together. They work hand in hand, but this is directly from Workforce Solutions. So what we were seeing is that kind of at the peak, according to their data, New Mexico was at about 106,000 continuing claims. Obviously, we've cut that in around half. Uh, the most recent data we've seen, uh, actually, I think this was kind of a week late, about 65,000 that are continuing. In terms of initial claims, uh, we reached a peak of initial claims of around 28,000, and now we're down to about 4,000 or so added per week. As you look at the bars, however, prior to that kind of spike, where it says kind of 32820, so left of that spike, those bars are much lower than the bars that we're seeing now. And in fact, obviously, you know, you can imagine people are continuing to apply for uh, unemployment insurance. And I think that we're somewhere on the order of about four times the number now than prior to kind of recent history, uh, sort of prior to the, the, the onset of the pandemic and the, 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 the business restrictions being put in place. So, um, you know, that's, that's what we see. This isn't all too different than what we were seeing nationally except for the fact that if you compare what we looked like prior to the pandemic to what things look like now, we're slightly worse than the US average. So just slightly a greater percentage of people uh, are relative to what we were seeing prior to the pandemic are continuing to um, uh, uh, have initial claims. And in addition to that, the people on continuing claims is elevated relative to uh, pre-pandemic numbers compared to the US. So New Mexico is doing kind of slightly worse here than the US average. Okay, so as I mentioned, kind of shifting gears here, uh, I talked about the uh, that kind of that additional bonus benefit that folks were receiving from being unemployed. And that was that $600 um, check and this is a, a story from the New York Times, or at least the, the, the chart is from the New York Times from months and months ago. And the reason why I'm including this is because uh, there was the ex not really an extension, but there was an additional $300 kind of bonus for unemployed people on unemployment um, that was uh, allotted uh, through December. And so it kind of is irrelevant from that standpoint. So to see how this particular aspect of the um, aspect of this initial legislation kind of played out in New Mexico. New Mexico was one of the greatest beneficiaries relative to the average wages or relative to the average unemployment benefit uh, of just about every state in the country. The one exception is Maine, which basically New Mexico is on par with. So in New Mexico, a $943 a, a, as a result of this and 128% of average wage. And so that's $600 plus the 343 of the actual benefit um, when we get to that 943 number. Basically the point is, is that providing any additional benefit to New Mexicans because we're a relatively low wage and relatively poor state disproportionately benefits New Mexico. And as you can imagine, as you pull that back Although New Mexico is still in somewhat of a better position, even at $300 or at any number relative to other states, it still represents a relatively larger impact to them, uh, to New Mexicans in terms of their spending power, because it's a losing 300 bucks to a New Mexican is kind of on average is a, a huge deal. Um, so just kind of pointing that out. And unless it's the case that uh, additional stimulus is allocated, kind of this withdrawal or limitation of federal support, obviously you can imagine will have a huge impact on New Mexico. One of the slides that I'll show you in a minute, uh, well, in a couple minutes anyway, is our forecast for, for income and personal income. And this type of, uh, this type of 
income goes into the personal income calculation. It's what's called a transfer payment. And so when we get there, we'll see what the impact of these transfer payments. So this is one of the transfer payments. Obviously there's many other types of transfer payments, but what the impact of these huge influx of transfer payments in New Mexico has been, and the result of kind of the expectation that some of it will be pulled back in the future will look like. Okay, so again, switching gears, now talking about kind of the oil industry. As I mentioned several times, the oil industry is critical in New Mexico. It's a, a, an industry that employs thousands and thousands of people in both the mining industries and in construction and professional and technical services. Uh, it sort of secondarily provides impact to other industries such as retail trade, accommodation and food services, other services, a bunch of industries um, that either directly or indirectly benefit from this industry in New Mexico. And again, not to mention the fact that it's an important input into the state budget. And when you hear every year, you know, the state has, you know, this much money and new money to spend. A lot of that comes from this industry, it comes from other places too, other gross receipts, collections, et cetera. But this is especially more recently has been a huge player. So just so that we can see kind of the trend throughout the year, the kind of pinkish bars are drilling rigs. So these are rigs that are sent out, kind of contraptions that are sent out into oil fields that literally drill, drill for oil. So it's kind of the, the first part of the process of actually getting the oil out of the ground is sending these rigs out to drill down and set up a system to pump out the oil. As you can see, basically sort of near the end of February, New Mexico hit its peak in terms of the number of drilling rigs that it had operational, it was 117. Um, and it's, I'll show you in the next slide. 117 in New Mexico is a lot. And as it turns out, New Mexico has become nationally a much bigger player over the last several years in this particular industry. So New Mexico hit about 117 rigs, kind of end uh, February, beginning March. And as the oil price really started to plummet, so the oil price is the black line, it's referenced to the left axis. You can see price around uh, mid-April or sort of end April hit about $4 per barrel. And for those of you who recall, I mean, I know me and Jeff were watching this, you know, sort of refreshing our browser on a daily, not even daily, sort of on, on a, a, a by uh by hourly basis or something. And we were watching the oil price on a day and I can't remember what exactly what day it was, actually dipped to minus like 33. Yeah, minus $33. Um, that was kind of a weird fluky thing. Price bounced back the next day a little bit, but for kind of that period of time, for that average, it was only $4 per barrel. As you can see, the lines sort of start to come up uh, you can see it sort of level out somewhere in the range of sort of between 30 to $40 or so per barrel. It's sitting, when I made this slide, it was sitting right around $37 per barrel. And as I mentioned today, it's about $41 per barrel. So you can imagine if you are an oil producer, one of the things you really pay attention to is what oil price looks like. So you can, uh, you would expect that drilling rigs would sort of follow, you know, maybe not perfectly, something of the trend of what oil prices look like. And you can kind of see that. So as oil prices really start to dip, so as that black line starts to dip, you see the bars really start to kind of decline. So we get to sometime in kind of mid uh, April or so, beginning of May, and we're sitting on the order of about 60 rigs. So basically about half of what we were seeing just basically a month or two prior. We see rigs continue to kind of decline until about sort of mid-July, maybe a little bit more through about end August, beginning of September, but they've since leveled out to about 47 rigs um, at any one time operational in New Mexico. So kind of spent all that time talking about that. What does that mean relative to the US in terms of New Mexico's position in this industry? So I have two lines here. The, the red kind of line is uh, drilling rigs. And this is New Mexico's percentage of total US rigs. And I also have oil production. How has oil production changed through time in New Mexico? And I said, obviously, this is a really big industry. This is an important industry in New Mexico in terms of uh, state funds and in terms of supporting other industries, especially in the Southeast part of the state. What we see is that both the oil production and the number of drilling rigs 
represented about four or so percent of the US for each of those metrics. So about 4% of all drilling rigs basically in January of 2016 were operational in New Mexico. About 4% of all oil produced in the US was being produced in New Mexico. What we can see through time is that those numbers, those percentages relative to the US have increased. So through time, the number of drilling rigs or at least the percentage of drilling rigs operational in the US um, that are kind of uh, being drilled and being used in New Mexico has increased. And as it was the, as price really plummeted and even as the number of rigs started to decline in New Mexico, the rate of decline was relatively slower here. So for a point in time, 20%, nearly 20% of all rigs operational in the US were operational in New Mexico, which to me is pretty stunning given, you know, we're a relatively small state that has since kind of gone down, even though it's the case that New Mexico has uh, sort of flattened out or maybe even increased slightly in terms of the number of rigs that are being uh, kind of operational in New Mexico, that has dipped down a little bit to 16.1%. Still sort of, you know, four times in terms of percent higher than what we were seeing in 2016. So despite the relatively low oil prices, um, despite sort of kind of anything going on in the industry internationally or in the US, New Mexico has become a place that is of kind of critical importance to this industry. And so um, you can imagine that as a result, the volume of oil that's produced in New Mexico relative to the US has increased as well. So we're sitting nearly 10% of all oil that's produced in the US comes from New Mexico. So it's an industry that is uh, obviously important to the state budget and has become for New Mexico an important industry uh, a national kind of in a, on a national scale. Okay, so I alluded to this already and obviously the oil industry plays a huge role here, but um, what, we're, what, what I'm showing is sort of what, what gross receipts looks like over the months of April, May, and June. And these are the months obviously during kind of the initial closures when the pandemic really started to ramp up sort of the first kind of really big spike that we were seeing. Um, obviously we're going through a, a, a even bigger spike now. So it will, it'll be interesting to see how these data uh, look kind of in the next few months. But at least at this point, what we were seeing is as a result of um, kind of the pandemic, uh, we're sort of seeing this pullback in GRT, both from the industries that you would expect that would be pulled back from something like a recession and a pandemic, things like uh, trade transportation and utilities. So that includes things like retail trade or leisure and hospitality as businesses kind of have to limit the number of occupants or what have you. Uh, those industries being uh, kind of harmed and obviously bringing down the monies coming into the state but also other industries like mining, as I mentioned. So uh, kind of getting hit from both, uh, from, from two different fiscal sides at the same time. Um, and as you can imagine, if you are planning uh, your, your budgets, your kind of state budgets, the, the, the monies that you'll have available to make decisions in the future, these kind of new data, if you kind of looked at what the projections were, you know, six months prior, are in a completely different ballpark than, than, than what the data obviously looked like after they came in. So clearly uh, there had to be a, a revision of expectations in terms of uh, kind of monies available to spend as a result of the pandemic and as a result of the mining industry kind of taking a hit over those months. Okay, so kind of switching gears, we're not gonna spend a ton of time here. I just wanna point this out. Uh, a source of data that I think might be useful for folks. So this is tracktherecovery.org. You can look at how New Mexico compares to the other states along any number of metrics. I'm just gonna have a few selection, uh, a few select uh, variables here that I think are sort of useful. So, uh, so change in, in employment, New Mexico is kind of the, the dark line. The other states are kind of these um, these lighter blue lines. Uh, obviously, I don't know which state is which other than New Mexico, but it gives us an idea of how New Mexico is faring compared to everybody else. In addition to that, the kind of vertical hash lines that we're seeing uh, on each of the graphs, that denotes uh, important 
kind of landmarks over the last several months in terms of um, kind of COVID. And this is looking sort of COVID specifically. So for example, the first U US COVID case, January, 20, uh, January 20th, March 16th, public schools closed, New Mexico public schools closed, March 24th, New Mexico stay at home advisory, et cetera. So you can see on the slide um, how, or you know, which, when these landmark events kind of happened. Now, obviously with kind of an additional round of closures, we don't know what things are gonna look like going forward. Uh, but historically, this is how these variables have looked in New Mexico relative to our sort of peers. So change of employment, we kind of were uh, moving along similar to what the, what the states, rest, what the rest of the states look like. Not, not a lot of difference there, but the industry composition is different here. So health and education services, we actually had seen at least through August, according to these data, uh, sort of an uptick relative to our peers. Retail trade, on the other hand, New Mexico took a little bit didn't, wasn't hit nearly as bad in April and May, but we haven't really recovered those jobs as kind of quickly as maybe other places have. Same thing for retail uh, and transportation, if you include transportation in there too. Changes in consumer spending. So New Mexico consumer spending has fallen behind. So uh, New Mexico consumers aren't spending as much relative uh, to their peers. What's really being hit is low income areas and some middle income areas, high income, there's a lot of noise here. It's really difficult to kind of determine what's happening um, just because of the, the relatively huge, relatively large oscillations kind of from, from period to period. But what we see, at least in the low and sort of middle income cohorts, New Mexico has hit, been uh, hit sort of relatively harder in terms of consumer spending. And you can imagine that if people aren't spending money, then that's making it difficult for the economy to start to kind of uh, work its engine again. Uh, similarly, kind of business revenue. So small business revenue, you see um, New Mexico, actually uh, small business revenue fell a little bit more and it's recovered a little bit less. And we see a couple of other industries. So leisure and hospitality, somewhere in between retail and transportation, somewhere in between education and health services. Uh, somewhere in between as well. So um, it isn't, doesn't seem to be confined to any one industry. It sort of seems to be more broadly felt across the industry. So um, I just wanted to kind of point out this particular uh, source of data, source of information. It gives you the ability to kind of compare how New Mexico, at least on some metrics, how New Mexico compares to other states. Uh, small business open, leisure and hospitality, retail trade, education, health services. So I encourage you to go check out this. Okay, so moving on to the actual forecast. And as I mentioned, this forecast was produced prior to the uh, election. So uh, take that for what that's worth. But I don't know that that would have necessarily, I don't know if the outcome of the election would have necessarily changed much of our expectations, to be honest with you, at least um, kind of in broad strokes. So New Mexico economic outlook 2020 through 2025. So the forecast turns on our expectations regarding the control of COVID-19. And so this is a slide that we kind of have the last several times that we've done a forecast we've included uh, when we present this information. Uh, and sort of the hope was that there would be um, a sort of a, a V-shaped recovery. So a single wave of COVID ending in early summer return to work with a quick recovery. So that's kind of the, the best possible situation. Um, we, as I, I'm gonna say in the next bullet down, down there, we, we never kind of assumed that from New Mexico, but there was hope for the US economy that that would be the case. Uh, it doesn't really look like that's quite the trajectory of the US economy either. So kind of B, limited activity through summer, deep recession with about a two-year recovery, sort of what's called a U-shaped recovery. That's kind of more of what we expect for the New Mexico economy. And then finally C, a prolonged struggle that wipes out households and business balance sheets and there are years of recovery. So um, somewhere in between a U and an L-shaped would have been really what happened, I think, after the Great Recession. Um, it took us uh, years and years to get back to employment levels that we saw prior to the Great Recession. So for example, obviously we look at the various parts of the state. Uh, one of the places clearly that we look at is the Albuquerque metropolitan area. It wasn't until I think the fourth quarter of 2019 that we ended up at a level of employment that exceeded what we saw prior to the Great Recession. 
And so it took basically 10 years to get back to where we were. And so that's more of kind of an L-shaped recession. So what we think, you know, the data that we have, what we're looking at now, the kind of expectations for the national economy is that we're expecting something more akin to what kind of I mentioned for B, a U-shaped type uh, recovery. And so um, what are we seeing in terms of the data or what are our expectations look like? So we're expecting that when, oh, before I get here real quick. So obviously there's, there's many different metrics that you can look at in terms of how the economy is behaving or how it's, um, how it's performing. The one metric that we look at probably as much of uh, uh, or, or not more than any other metric is employment. The data, employment data that we use specifically for this forecast is what's called the quarterly census of employment and wages data. So these are actual kind of counts of jobs, actual counts of um, people kind of working at jobs. There's obviously other sources of data, and I'm sure many of you already know this. Um, the, the one piece of data, the one data source that is often reported is the, uh, the, the CES data, so the current employment statistics data. And those data are survey-based and they are up to date, you know, they're sort of a month lag because you can't know exactly what's going on in this month. So we know what happened kind of prior month, but they're survey based. And as a result, they're subject to survey error, as you can imagine. And so what we found is that the survey error kind of has exceeded our tolerance in, in terms of being able to project. So Although we use those CES data as an input to understanding the New Mexico economy, what we use in terms of forecasting the New Mexico economy is the census data, the quarterly census of employment and wages data. The problem with that data is that because it's an actual count, it takes time and as a result, it's delayed. So it's about six months delayed. So when we're doing our forecasts, we use that QCW data and we supplement it with the CES information and other data that we have at our disposal. So anything that's coming in that might give us a little bit better understanding of how employment in particular industries in various parts of the states and various parts of the state may be kind of advancing. Okay, so with all that said, when we did our forecast, the most recent quarter of data that was available was the first calendar quarter of 2020. In the first calendar quarter of 2020, we didn't see job loss yet. We actually saw job growth. This is the case in New Mexico. It's the case nationally. The reason is, although we started losing jobs in the second half of March, obviously the data is quarterized. So that takes care of some of that. But in addition to that, many of the jobs were lost after kind of the reporting deadlines for um, the, the QCW data and after the surveys were completed for the CES data. So uh, if you were to go back and look at what the data say for the first quarter of 2020, you will actually see job growth, even though we lost jobs uh, for all intents and purposes in March. So that said, our projection for the second quarter using kind of all the data that we have at our disposal is the New Mexico economy lost about 82,000 jobs. And this is going to be kind of quarter over the previous quarter. Most of the statistics that I'll talk about will be year over year, but for this one, it's important to look at how many jobs were lost compared to the quarter prior, because we wanna kind of get a better under, uh, understanding of um, which jobs are lost as a result of pandemic. And this allows us to do it a little bit better, at least for these purposes, for this kind of narrow purposes. Hey Mo, we before, expect you, sure. before you go on, uh, yeah. we have a question. Could you talk a little bit about the K-shape Recovery? Um, I don't, I'm not prepared to really talk about that at the moment, I have to say. Um, let me, let me get back to you on that, if you don't mind. Okay, no problem. Okay, so trudging ahead. Um, so the, uh, the loss of 82,000 jobs, that's our expectation in the second quarter before gaining back 27,000 or so jobs in the third quarter, an additional 21,000 jobs, that should be 21,180, not whatever that is, in the fourth quarter. And then so 2020, the average will be down about 40,000 jobs or about 5% compared to 2019. The recovery we expect, go back, 
We expect the recovery to start kind of gaining steam in New Mexico in 2021 and the expected average and expected to average about 1.3% per year sort of thereafter. So by historical standards, a, a, a slow rate of growth. And by historical, I mean over a very long period of time. If you look at kind of um, post great recession rates of growth, this is kind of in that ballpark of about 1.3% or so. According to this particular forecast that we produced this time, the economy exceeds 2019 levels in terms of total people working by 2024 by about 3,000 jobs. By 2025, it exceeds it by about 14,000 jobs above the 2019 levels. What I can tell you is based on the newest data that we have available to us, is that we uh, have revised this forecast up slightly. Of course, this was before the huge spike in COVID cases. So it might be the case that our next forecast, we kind of pull back on that a little bit. That, that sort of remains to be seen. We'll have to see how things kind of play out. But at least at the moment for this forecast, we're expecting basically to be back to 2019 levels by 2024, which, you know, that's it's a long time. Um, so there's that. Income patterns are slightly different uh, compared to the employment patterns um, because there's strong growth in 2020. And the reason for that strong growth, as I sort of already alluded to, is the transfer payments. That is a substitute for a lot of money that's lost through kind of the, the, the largest portion of uh, personal income, which is wage and salary income. We're expecting weakness in 2021 and then accelerating slowly thereafter. Okay, so in terms of uh, what we are looking at for employment growth, so this is kind of year over year growth. So I'm not looking quarter over quarter anymore. I'm looking kind of year over the same quarter a year prior. Uh, we expected that the New Mexico economy lost about 10% of its jobs. And this is, by the way, this is uh, jobs that are um, people that are covered by unemployment insurance. So this does not include gig workers or uh, contractors or anything like that. So it just includes the universe of people that are covered by unemployment insurance. So a contraction of about 9.6% in the second quarter and kind of slowing rates of job loss thereafter through the rest of the year. Obviously there will be a bounce back in the next year as some of those jobs year over year are recovered, but still despite kind of those bounce backs it's not going to be until 2024 that we are expecting, at least at this point, that we'll be back to the levels that we were prior to 2019 or at 2019, prior to 2020. So the sectors that we expect, at least in 2020, to uh, lose the most jobs, because essentially every, every sector is expected to lose jobs in 2020, accommodation and food services, as you can imagine, and retail trade. So those are the ones that are going to be hit the most. What I can say is both of those sectors, especially accommodation and food services are very large. It's a big sector, it employs a lot of people. And so the loss of 11,000 jobs, although a substantial number in terms of percent, it isn't as big as maybe some other sectors that lose relatively fewer jobs. So for example, mining. Mining we're expecting in 2020 will lose about 5,000 jobs, which comprises something on the order of about 23 or 24% of that industry's kind of the, the number of jobs in that industry. So uh, the ones that we are expecting to do kind of the worst in terms of jobs, mining, retail trade, administrative and waste management, which includes kind of temporary workers, call center workers, kind of surprisingly, and some other folks uh, we're expecting to do relatively poorly. And as I mentioned already, accommodation and food services. What you'll notice at the very bottom is federal government. Actually, our expectation is that jobs got added in federal government Really, that has to do with kind of the spike uh, that we saw sort of in the second quarter of census workers. So those are temporary workers. And it actually could be the case that uh, in our next forecast, we'll have that closer to zero and not quite as many. I think it's around 1,000 there for the year. Um, I would expect that number to come down in our next forecast. <clears throat> OK, so if we look at the period 2020 quarter through through 2021 quarter two. And it's not that there's anything magical about this four quarter period, other than it's a four quarter period that occurs after the job losses in the second quarter. 
So which sectors do we expect to add jobs, kind of add the greatest number of jobs or recover the most? Well, as you can imagine, many of the sectors that are adding the most jobs are the ones that lost the most jobs. So a job loss in the second quarter of 82,500, our expectation is a gain of 57,500 jobs over that four quarter period. And the sectors that we expect to do best, sectors like accommodations, gaining some of those job backs, jobs that it lost back, retail trade, gaining some of those jobs that it lost back, and mining and administrative and waste services. Healthcare, we're expecting to do reasonably well after losing jobs in the second quarter, we expect that sector to kind of bounce back kind of immediately in the third quarter. So uh, those data such as they are. So over the longer period from 2021 through 2025, the sectors that we expect to kind of do relatively well over that period, uh, number one is the healthcare and social assistance sector. So about 10,500 jobs we're expecting to be added over that period. This is a huge sector in terms of the number of people that it employs. So the rate of growth here is relatively slow, but still a very large number of jobs we're expecting to be added. Also, as those jobs continue to get filled in in accommodation and food services, adding over 7,600 jobs, construction doing relatively well, adding about 3,970 jobs, professional and technical services, which the forecasts, both from where we receive our national forecast as an input to our state forecast and from other folks that um, do economic forecasts, this sector is expected to do well over the, the longer term and actually even over kind of the medium term, adding over 5,000 jobs. Admin, as I mentioned, losing a bunch of jobs in 2020, adding many of those jobs back over the period. So personal income forecast, you see that spike 12% sort of year over year growth in the second quarter. As I mentioned already a couple times that has to do with the uh, transfer payments um, and it will become a little bit more clear when I break out the income uh, components in a moment. But uh, when we did this forecast, a lot of folks expected that there would be an additional stimulus in the fourth quarter. We didn't really expect that. And so that's not included in our forecast. We anticipated that there would be kind of gridlock <laughs> and that something like that wouldn't be at least uh, kind of huge like we were seeing in that, in that second quarter. Okay, so income by component. So I have kind of these annual numbers. These are kind of change uh, year compared to the prior year, 2020, 2021 through 2025. So what you see is kind of this orange, this huge orange bar in 2020. And that has to do with, even though we have the other components being either negative or relatively small, like private wage and salary, government wage and salary, et cetera, we have this huge increase in transfer payments. So these transfer payments include anything from um, at least in this case, the, the difference in this case is those $1,200 checks that got sent out to everyone, well, almost everyone, the, uh, the unemployment kind of bonus uh, insurance, that $600 thing that I had talked about before, and unemployment insurance as well that had been extended. And so you can imagine that there's this huge increase in the transfers that are coming that's washing out this either flat or declined declining uh, wage and salary uh, income. So we had this huge increase in 2020, 2021, we're expecting that to get pulled back and actually go negative in, in terms of the, the transfer payments on net because we're expecting uh, personal income to be positive, personal income growth to be positive. We're expecting basically 0% growth in 2020 in income. 2022, something on the order of about 2.5% growth as we start seeing some of the other uh, elements of um, income continue along a similar pace, but basically no growth in transfer payments. And then 2023 through 2025, we see some growth in the all the components of income, but we're actually now seeing growth in transfer payments again. Um, kind of an aside is that Historically, New Mexico has received a lot of transfer payments relative to other states. And that has to do with New Mexico being a relatively poor state and qualifying for um, many of the uh, residents qual qualifying for different kind of federal programs that provide transfers to those individuals um, and it kind of disproportionate relative to other states. Okay, so very quickly, just looking at uh, the rest of the state. So when we do our forecast, we look at, 
the various metropolitan areas, Albuquerque, Las Cruces, Santa Fe, Farmington. Uh, we also have now started to include Lee and Eddy County because oil, the oil industry is so important and such a driver to the state budget. We've broken that out and are including that as its own kind of forecasted geography. And in addition to that, we forecast sort of the rest of New Mexico. So New Mexico minus all of those other defined places. And so we forecast all these, these places. And basically what this slide is kind of designed to show is which areas of the state are we expecting to get back to levels at what time, get back to 2019 employment levels at what kind of year. So everything is indexed to one. So uh, Albuquerque employment in 2019 is indexed to one, Las Cruces employment is indexed to one, et cetera. Obviously we see these sharp declines in 2020 in all the geographies. And we saw that see this kind of acceleration throughout the rest of the period in most places. Um, in Albuquerque, Las Cruces and Santa Fe, and obviously New Mexico as well, we're expecting basically by 2023 that employment levels will be back to 2019 levels. For Lee and Eddy County, we're expecting, uh, and for the rest of this, for Lee and Eddy County and for Farmington, we're expecting basically there to be a malaise for quite some time. Obviously, Lee and Eddy County, as I mentioned multiple times, depends highly on the oil industry. And so to the extent that oil prices, for example, quickly go through the roof, and there's a reinvestment in that in that part of the state in this industry, or if they uh, that part of the state becomes much more diversified in terms of its economy and attracts other industries there, you can imagine that there is uh, some room for um, kind of this trajectory to change. One thing to kind of note about the oil industry, however, is that our expectation is that the that industry will become more uh, kind of efficient in terms of its, in terms of its um, kind of capital usage, and will become a little bit less labor dependent going forward. So some of the opportunities that might have in the past been available to that industry in terms of employing tons and tons of people, we think going forward as technology continues to improve, and as drilling becomes more efficient, we expect that there will be the requirement, the labor requirement will be relatively lower than it's been in the past. So some real quick alternative scenarios in this forecast. So we produce, uh, in addition to kind of this baseline scenario that I've talked about so far, we produce alternative scenarios. Obviously what dictates these scenarios is both epidemiology in terms of COVID and also economic factors, of course. Our forecast kind of expects that we'll have sort of a U-shaped recovery or you know, maybe even sort of a swoosh shaped recovery. Um, and you know, that actually, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, I think that you know, what, what you call the, 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 uh, the recovery is sort of in some sense, I think if, if, you go, if you go and look at sort of how people talk about the economy and about how they expect the economy to progress through time, you'll see people look at the same graph and call it um, two different things. <laughs> You'll see somebody that calls an economy or a re recovery a V-shaped and somebody else call it a U-shaped. So, you know, the proof in a sense is in the pudding in terms of your interpretation of what it looks like, what the shape looks like, I guess. Really, what we often will look at is when do we recover back to where we were and how long does that take? So we offer with our forecast um, a baseline and two standard alternatives uh, plus a fourth more pessimistic scenario. So our, our two alternative scenarios are an optimistic scenario and just a generic pessimistic scenario. As I mentioned a couple times, we use an input of a national forecast from a national forecasting firm that uh, helps us to develop what our New Mexico forecasts look like. In addition to them sort of providing a baseline forecast, they provide an optimistic forecast and a pessimistic forecast. And those are sort of the inputs into our forecasting process. What you'll see here in a minute is the optimistic baseline and just generic pessimistic scenarios all look almost identical. <laughs> um, and that left us, us being me and Jeff, incredulous. So we created an additional pessimistic scenario that we think is a more reasonable pessimistic scenario, kind of a more worst case scenario that we're likely to encounter. 
So the pessimistic scenario, the kind of more um, likely pessimistic scenario that we might encounter is more L-shaped with incomplete recovery by the end of the forecast period. Okay, so there, here's our four forecast scenarios. And you see uh, the, the black line is the baseline. The um, red line is the optimistic scenario. And you see they're basically the same for most of the forecast. The pessimistic scenario is sort of the blue line. And this is just inputting through this kind of national firm's national forecast into our process. What you see is basically things dip below 2020 levels in 2021. This is kind of COVID continues and um, things get a little bit worse in the near term. The economy doesn't know how to react. And so it kind of moves sideways in 2021. But then the rate of growth thereafter through 2025 is relatively faster than the other scenarios. And we end up at a level in New Mexico almost uh, identical in all three cases, somewhere around the uh, order of 850,000 uh, workers who are covered by unemployment insurance. Because again, that's our measure for these purposes of uh, the kind of the, the economy. <clears throat> so what we have in kind of the gold line is we have things getting worse in 2021 and then things kind of going much slower through 2025. And if everything that I talked about in terms of the general malaise, uh, in terms of the economy, if COVID continues, if a vaccine really is and does not prove effective, et cetera, this is more of what we would expect going forward. So sitting well below what we were seeing in 2019, through 2025 in this scenario. Um, the good news, as I mentioned at the top, is it sounds like, you know, there is uh, some promise for some of these vaccines. Uh, a couple of firms have said that they have uh, some progress, so that's good. So hopefully we don't end up in that case. But just to give kind of a, a broader understanding or a broader representation of the possible scenarios, we've got that one too. Income plays a little bit differently where the optimistic scenario is buoyed by uh, generally higher uh, levels of growth in terms of wage and salary uh, than baseline and then compared to the other scenarios. And then in the two pessimistic scenarios, they're held back by essentially relatively low wage jobs um, being the drivers and keeping income low as a result moving forward. So um, that's kind of all that I have for this, but just one, one uh, mention of kind of the, the K shape of the, um, the economy and kind of the possibilities there. And I don't know, I saw that people were commenting at various points throughout. So kind of, I think what we've been calling that is the, the swoosh, <laughs> the Nike swoosh. And on some level that actually is a little bit what we expect the New Mexico economy to look like somewhere um, it's not quite a U, it's not quite a V, it's kind of somewhere in between. It drops, but then we have kind of this, uh, this slow acceleration until we get back to where we were prior. But it's definitely not a V and maybe a little bit better than a U. And so uh, I think, you know, that actually might be more of what the US economy ends up looking like. It's not gonna look like a V most likely either. And a U might be a little bit too severe. So we might, we might, New Mexico might trend more towards U than um, kind of a K. The US might trend toward more towards kind of this swoosh shape than a U. And so it's all a matter of semantics, but really for our purposes, it we're looking at um, when do we get back, at least for our purposes, again, in terms of employment, back to where we were prior to the recession. Obviously nationally, that's different. We look at employment too, and we'll, we wanna know when do we get back in terms of employment to where we were prior to the recession. Um, but GDP for a lot of folks is kind of the key measure there. And incidentally, one thing to know, this is going back to the national uh, picture is that, and I, I for, forgot to mention that. So the US economy is adding somewhere on the order of six to 700,000 jobs per month over the last couple of months. We obviously lost a ton of jobs kind of in those middle months of the year. If we continue to add jobs at that pace of, you know, somewhere between 500 and 700,000 jobs per month, it would take the US economy somewhere between like 13 and 18 months to get back to where we were prior to the recession. So a full year of growth and employment at the rates we've been seeing, which is probably unlikely, 
but it would take a full year at those rates to get back to that point. So I uh, just wanted to kind of point that out. And obviously New Mexico, um, we're not expecting that, right? We're expecting New Mexico to get back to where we were by 2024. So several years of recovery ahead is, is our expectation. So with that. Hey Mo, thank you so much. Of course. Um, just a couple quick questions. Um, one is in the in the industries, where does the film industry fall on your your chart showing the industry growth? I can actually, I'll go back. Uh, the film industry falls in what's called, uh, let me actually go back to this one. It falls in uh, generally in what's called information. So it's NAICS sector 51 uh, for data geeks like myself, but <laughs> it's, it's the information sector. The information sector is interesting uh, for a number of reasons. It includes a bunch of stuff. It includes publishing, it includes all kinds of things, but it includes the film industry generally too. Uh, one thing that I think that we've seen is although filming has, the film industry has really put down roots in New Mexico, there's a bunch of jobs in the industry. My suspicion is that many of those jobs are contract base, based and um, not, and many of those jobs aren't for people that are included in unemployment insurance. So they might not be included in these numbers. And so kind of a caveat there. Um, we don't really know for sure, but that's kind of, that's our, that's what we think anyway. Excellent. And then just one other question here um, on the uh, pessimistic two, did you include um, shutting down the economy again? So um, kind of implicitly we did pessimist. I mean, when, when we create it, it's like, well, what are the worst things that could possibly that we think could happen? It really, it really is a stop and start of the economy. It's a, you know, we'll be closed for two weeks here and then open for a month and then we have a spike and then those sorts of things. We can't be too precise in terms of, in terms of that because our ability to kind of project epidemiological events is, I mean, we're economists, we understand data generally um, but that's a little bit out of our wheel, wheelhouse. So we have to take some liberties and we have to say, well, we think based on our experience, you know, there could be a spike. We're reading all kinds of articles, you know, even going back a couple months ago that come to come fall, there's going to be spikes. And so the likelihood of closing down, at least for short periods of time, um, tend to uh, tend to be relatively high. One thing I'll note, though, is that even though it's the case that there is some precedent for us being able to understand what happens when there is a shutdown as a result of COVID. I would argue that it's not sufficient in terms of making us understand what would happen if there are subsequent shutdowns. What we have long anticipated is that, you know, one shutdown might not be too bad, but multiple shutdowns might do a lot of harm. Firms might not have tons of capital at their disposal to weather multiple shutdowns. They may have expended it all in their first shutdown. And so, um, you know, I, I'm not saying this as uh, a means to say, oh, well, we just need to go reopen anything, because I don't think that's the solution either, uh, if that's kind of the way that this is coming off. But I think that it's probably will be uh, borne out that it's likely that multiple shutdowns are relatively harder for the economy than you know just one shutdown that would have maybe extended a little longer, for example. Thank you, Mo. You know, and thank you very much for stepping in and covering for Jeff um, during this period of time. It's very helpful. Your your uh, presentation was great, and I saw lots of comments. Um, People are very happy to, to hear what you had to say today. Yeah, For no those, problem. I know, I know it's a downgrade. I know you all wanted Jeff, but got to step in sometimes. <laughs>
So uh, for those of you who are still on, our afternoon session will be Robert Radigan and Jacqueline Miller with UNM Geospatial Population Studies. They'll be covering New Mexico's responses to the 2020 census and New Mexico population estimates, the most current um, version. Also, we have a third session today starting at 3.30. It'll be Susanna Privet, who's our data dissemination specialist from the US Census Bureau. And she's gonna cover the data.census.gov platform and how do we pull tribal data. Um, so it, it really is kind of focusing on um, pulling data out of data.census.gov with a special focus on tribal data. So please join us back at that time. Um, a couple of questions people wanted to know. Yes, we did record the session and yes, we will post um, our recordings and um, the PowerPoints after the conference is over. So thank you for attending and I look forward to seeing you later this afternoon.